Let's welcome Fabio for Ref and Deferred. So hello everyone. Um, so all the concurrency in FS2 uh, is based on two very simple data structures, uh, ref and deferred. So we are going to, uh, we're not really going to look at how they work internally, but rather we're going to explore their API, uh, discuss the principles behind them, uh, and then see how they can help us build our concurrent abstractions from sort of simple counters all the way to concurrent finite state machines. So who am I? My name is Fabio. Um, I work for Ovo Energy. Uh, we do lots of scale, lots of FP. So if there's any of you that likes to uh, move to London, then let me know. Uh, <laughs> And I'm also an open source author uh, at System Informiga, mostly uh, as one of the core developers of FS2 uh, with Michael, uh, but also work at Cat Effect and HTTP4S and a bunch of other functional stuff. So let's start with a tiny bit of history, just in case some of you have seen different versions and like, kind of like to know how things came about. So in, back in FS2 0.9, we had this thing called Ref, which was actually a pretty complex beast based on a custom actor implementation and a sort of different, different API. And then for 0 0.10, I sort of redesigned that concurrency scheme to be based on ref and promise, which is basically what we have now. Uh, and in 1.0, we decided to move these things down to cat's effect uh, and rename promise to defer to avoid confusion with the standard library uh, thing, uh, which, is, which is different. But sorry. Uh, let's uh, start by uh, seeing what a ref is. So a ref is a purely function mutable reference. Um, it's a concurrent and lock free. Uh, it will always contain a value and it's built on IO and atomic reference. So hopefully I'm gonna explain like pretty much what all of this, all of this is. So let's start by looking at the basic API for it. Uh, you have this ref of A, uh, you can get from it, you can set new value to it. Uh, and notice how to create it, you always need to give it a value. So the ref is never empty, always contains, contains something. Uh, and every operation, so access, mutation, and creation is wrapped in I.O., which ensures purity. So I'm not going to talk about this aspect a whole lot, because I have a whole talk just on that, why it doesn't need to be pure and why it doesn't need to look, to look that way. Uh, and, but one thing I wanted to mention is that A is an immutable structure. So F, ref adds purely functional mutability on top of an immutable structure. So you can take a list, uh, put it in a ref, an immutable list, put it in a ref, and then sort of uh, purely functionally and concurrently modify it. And then the real version is polymorphic in F. So here I'm coding I.O., but later on I will show you the full, the full version. So let's see how to use this thing uh, with an example. Imagine some sort of reporting or logging or tracing. I have this method that takes uh, my trace, which is a ref of IO and list of string, uh, and a message, so, uh, which is what I want to report. So I get from the ref, uh, and then I set uh, the new content uh, by adding the message on, on the list. And, uh, and then I call site. Uh, I'm creating my empty, uh, empty trace, uh, and then I'm reporting one and two. But notice that start there. So start, it's a cat effect primitive that starts things in a fiber. So a fiber is a lightweight thread. So basically, those two things are happening concurrently. Uh, and so if any of you has ever done any concurrency, you probably see that uh, this is wrong. This can lose updates. Because basically, what happens if uh, I, the interleaving is one gets, and then, one, and then two gets, and then one sets, and then when two sets again, is overriding what, uh, what one had. So we just lost an update. Uh, so as it turns out, just get and set uh, is not enough as our API. So we need to add another method, which is called update. It takes a function from A to A and returns IO unit. So this is quite interesting because it means that for concurrent state, update is not the same as get and dot set, and then set, which is also the reason why the state moment is actually not good for a lot of real uh, FP, because you, know, you cannot do concurrent state with it. Uh, but once we do have this update method, then our report uh, is just, uh, I'm gonna update the trace uh, with, uh, with a new message, uh, and that sort of fixes, fixes the problem. So the key thing here is that ref supports concurrent state. It's not just sort of sequential state. Um, but then let's see, let's look at another example. Imagine I'm modeling some sort of race. Uh, there's a sprinter with a name, and then the finish line is just a ref that contains an int, which is the order of arrival. Uh, and I'm gonna, so each sprinter is gonna update uh, the finish line, so plus one, and you know, we update is safe. Fine. 
Uh, and then I'm going to get it again to get what I just, you know, where I just arrived. And then I'm going to print saying, well, uh, I arrived at this position. Uh, and again, an example, uh, we start with, uh, you know, a zero, um, the RF initialized to zero. And then again, pass sequence takes a list of IOs and kind of starts them all concurrently, uh, passing the finish line. So they will all, all going to update the same, the same finish line. Well, but now you can get a wrong order. Well, why? So I update, uh, I update the, the finish line, and then someone else updates before I can get. So we both get the same thing, and now it ends up like where like both A and B are going to arrive second. So again, another, another race condition. So as it turns out, update is also not enough as the base, the base operation. So we actually do need is this modify thing. So modify is similar to update. Update at an A to A and return IO of unit. Whereas modify takes a function from A to both A and B. So both a new, uh, a new state and a result based on, on arbitrary logic. And it's going to return me that result. And now, uh, to, to implement Sprinter, uh, I'm going to call modify instead of update. And update the, 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 the state itself, but also return my own, my own position. And now we've eliminated that, that race condition. And yeah, as it turns out, update is actually uh, syntactic sugar over, over modify. Uh, so this is what we can do with ref. What is it that we can't do? So this looks like update, but there's a crucial difference. It's not just A to A, it's A to IO of A. So we want to say that we want to update the state of the ref, but in the process, we also want to do arbitrary effects, like maybe write to a database or write, read from, from a socket or, or things like that. And this does not exist on ref and actually cannot exist uh, by design. So why is that? So if you look at the way update is implemented, um, it's actually not using locking. So uh, like a few slides ago, I said, you know, it's concurrent and lock-free. So it's actually not using a locking. It's not using a lock. It's using a, a thing called atomic reference, which is a very lightweight Java primitive uh, with this compare swap uh, operation, where basically you can say, I'm only going to atomically set this thing to a new value uh, if uh, the state, the current state is equal to this other value. So the way it works, you have, like, this is it's fairly complicated if you're not into lock-free programming, but it's like the simplest lock-free thing you can possibly do. It's a, called a, a cast loop, compare swap loop. So basically, I get the old state from your topic reference. This is an immutable thing, the, the state I, I just got. Then I update it. And then atomically, I'm basically trying to say this. Uh, if the state didn't change from when I read it, then set it to a new thing, otherwise retry. So what happens is that if there's no other thing uh, contending on the same ref, it just updates, and if not, it's going to retry a few times um, until it succeeds. So the problem with that, uh, obviously, is that depending on how much contention you have, you might need to retry f a non-deterministic amount of times, which is fine if ref does not have any effect, but if you also like write into a DB, you don't want to be writing one or two or three or a billion times. It just doesn't work like that. However, it does mean that this has amazing performance. So an atomic reference is way faster than a lock. Uh, and also, it kind of cannot the lock. Um, because if you have a lock and your trade is not scheduled anymore, then not, no one can, can, can make any, any progress. Whereas with an atomic reference, other, other computation can still, can still make progress. So at least at the like, low level, um, uh, it cannot, it cannot that lock. So yeah, so this, this is the, um, sort of the, the trade-off there. And that was ref, that's it. Uh, and now let's look at deferred. So deferred is a primitive for purely functional synchronization. Uh, it has simple one-shot semantics, which we are going to discuss. Uh, and it has what we call semantic blocking. So I'd like to explain this because it's fairly confusing because we basically made this term up. Um, but basically, so the way concurrency works in class of thread, we have all these fibers, so lightweight threads. And there are many of those running on a single uh, JVM thread or, or on a few JVM threads. So you might have a thread pool with four threads and you know, 200,000 fibers on it. So by semantic blocking, we just mean that the fiber is waiting, but the underlying thread actually is not. So even if my fiber is waiting, the thread uh, is free to run other fibers. So the TL, uh, TLDR is that blocking a fiber is fine. It's not like blocking a thread where, like, uh, 
ultimately, the problem is that you cannot have that many trades. Trades are a scarce resource where you can have a lot of fibers. So blocking one is not, it's not that big of a deal. Uh, and what are the semantics of, of, of the deferred API? So it's very simple. This is the final thing. Uh, uh, there's only two methods and, and the constructor. So a deferred starts empty. So you can see that the, the apply doesn't take any parameter. Uh, and then a somebody will become full when you call complete. Uh, and then once it's full, it will never become empty or change its value again. So that's it. Um, and so what does these two methods do? So if you call gets on a full deferred, it will just immediately return the value that's there. Uh, and if you call gets on an empty deferred, it will, it's going to semantically block until a value is available. And this can be interrupted if needed with you know, the rest of the cat's effect API, like timeouts or whatever. Uh, what about complete? So if you call complete on an empty deferred, it will fill the deferred and then awake uh, all, all the readers, unblocking them. And then if you call it on a full deferred, it will fail. Uh, and that's it. So let's look at an example of why this might be useful. Uh, let's say we have some sort of consumer that can synchronously read uh, from something. And imagine that this consumer has a slow setup method. Maybe it needs to set out a few connections or like, you know, connect to a DB or whatever. Uh, we also have a producer, again, kind of a synchronous write method, takes a message and, and writes to the consumer. And this also needs to, uh, not, needs to be set up in a fairly slow, fairly slow uh, manner. So you want to do both of these things concurrently, right? So obviously I made a mistake, but spoiler alert, you can lose a message. Um, so what consumer is going to do is going to sort of set up itself uh, and then read and then print, I've received this message. And then producer is also going to set up itself, uh, write this message and then said, well, I've, I've written this. And I'm doing both of these uh, sort of concurrently. So, but what happens if the producer setup is faster than the consumer setup? So it's gonna set up and then just write to nothing because the, the consumer is not yet set up and so the message is gonna get lost. Assume that this doesn't have a, any queue or you know, dead letters or anything. Um, and so you have a problem now because depending on, on, the, on the race between producer and consumer setup, uh, you might lose a message. But also you don't really wanna do this sequentially because the setup is low, you wanna sort of parallelize it. Uh, and so yeah, you can, mess you can lose a message. So the way you can fix this is by introducing a gate. So we're gonna use a very simple deferred, a deferred of unit. So it's a deferred that is gonna com be completed with a simple unit. So like, you know, an, kind of an empty, an empty message. Uh, I'm gonna, the consumer is gonna set up and then it's gonna complete the deferred with unit. And then it's gonna just proceed in, in reading. Uh, and the producer is, is also gonna set up and then it's gonna get on that deferred and then write. So what happens? If the consumer is faster, uh, it's gonna complete, and then by the time the uh, uh, producer um, does get, then the value is already there, immediately returns, everything is fine. But if the producer is faster, it will go get, and get will wait until the deferred is, is complete. So you kinda introduce this happens before relationship between the two, and now you're not gonna be able to write until you know that the consumer is set up, and so you don't lose, you don't lose the message anymore. However, what if this setup fails here? So you know like when there's a failure in a monadic computation, it's gonna short circuit, you're not gonna complete the thing, and this is waiting for it, and now it's stuck. So obviously you can time out, this is interruptible, and in some system this is the best you can do. We can do a bit better here by just saying, well, I'm gonna attempt this. Attempt just takes a f of a and gives you f of either trouble of, of a, whatever. So it doesn't show secret anymore. And then we complete the deferred with either a trouble or a unit. So we know that it's always gonna be completed with something, either the error or the result. And then here, I'm gonna get that. And then what retro does is basically, if you have a value, it just gives you the value. And if you have the trouble, you're gonna erase the trouble. So we fixed the issue. But the main point I'm making with this slide is that as soon as you introduce some weighting and some synchronization, complexity increases immediately. Because you need to, you need to you know, think about, okay, what happens if this condition never, is never fulfilled? And in fact, this is actually not safe when you take interruption into account, which I'm only gonna talk about kind of in the last, the last two or three slides. But this is mostly like, waiting means complexity, like cautionary 
tail. Okay, so let's recap the API, which as you can see, like if it sort of fits in a slide. So you have, you have a ref of A, you can get uh, from it, you can set it, and you can modify it with the signature we've seen before. And then you need to pass a value to it to create, to create it. And then if uh, you can wait on it, or you can complete it, or you can create an empty one. So I think by now, you can, I think you can sort of see why these are like little uh, useful tools. But it might be harder to see how are those fundamental building blocks. They seem kind of awfully limited. So ref cannot do effectful updates, which you kind of want to do you know, quite, quite often. And the third can only wait on a single thing, and then it's kind of done, sort of useless. So how do you actually build things with these two? And also, why, why do you do it this way, as opposed to using locks or MVAR or other, uh, other sort of approaches to concurrency? So the key idea behind this design is to separate concurrent state from synchronization. And then we're going to try and design sort of the simplest primitive for both. And then we're going to try and assemble them compositionally. And so in English, the key idea behind ref is like, I want to change the value atomically. And the key idea behind the third is like, I want to wait for something to happen. That's it. And why? So why do you want to do it this way? So first of all, notice how like ref cannot deadlock. You can introduce waiting only when needed. Because remember, every time you wait, you're introducing a possible deadlock. So the least you wait, the better. And the way you do that is by putting deferred inside refs. Um, and deferred is unidirectional waiting. So it can only wait in, on one thing. Uh, I mean, I don't know how many of you have done like any Haskell, but like MVAR, for example, can wait on the you know, full MVAR, on an empty MVAR, and it can go back to full and, and empty uh, as many times uh, as, the, as you know, the, the code uh, wants it to. But given that the Fed is unidirectional waiting, if you want to wait on a different condition, you have to produce a different deferred, which you do by changing the ref. And so that means that most of your logic actually end up in this very simple uh, modify function, which is not effectful. So you actually end up encoding a lot of logic in a very simple sort of non-effectful function. Uh, and I have an example because this probably makes little sense. Uh, but that was the idea, pretty much. So you can do that in several different ways, uh, several different patterns. What I found fairly useful for, for a lot of use cases is this sort of idea of funny state machines, which I'm introducing fairly informally here. So there's a set of states, and there are concurrent inputs. So this is actually a generalization, because generally you assume there's only one input that the machine is consuming. But in this case, there are concurrent inputs. And there are transitions between states on inputs. And once the transition is done, I want to run an action. So how do I do that? So that description translates pretty much to this. I have a state, and I return a new state, and then the action I want to run once the transition has happened. And if you look at the signature modify, it kind of fits, right? You have that B, which unifies with FC. And so that means that if you pass transition to modify, you're going to get an F of FC, where you can just then flatten to execute the action after the transition is done. So modify actually fits really well with this sort of finite state machine uh, transition. Um, and yeah, so little aside, so you might think, okay, this is, looks sort of not too dissimilar from, from an actor, right? Because like you, you have this state evolving uh, in according to inputs. Uh, and in some ways it is internally, but the, the code ends up looking and feeling very different. And I kind of, I think I've, I've scrubbed it down to two things. So first of all, the, the sh uh, state sharing is very, very different because of how sort of purity works. And again, I have like a full talk just on this, but basically you're forced to pass arguments to make sure that things are shared. So you can have the spaghetti uh, phenomenon of you know, not, not knowing which, which thing is modifying which. And the other thing is that with stream, you can still centralize behavior. So one of the problems I have with, with, with ACA is that often to encode a simple sort of pattern of behavior, you have several different actors scattered in different places communicating with each other. Whereas with stream, you can encode all the different, um, uh, all the different behaviors in a single place. So it ends up feeling 
uh, a lot more like uh, functional reactive programming. And again, I've given a talk on this as well, so I don't have time to expand, uh, but like, either take my word for it uh, or just come and talk to me and we'll, we'll talk about this. So, uh, example, uh, I want to encode um, sort of a cached value. So let's start by looking at that create there. It takes an f of a, which is sort of the computation that we might want to sort of cache. Um, and the semantics I've picked is that get uh, should uh, sort of trigger that f of a if there's nothing there, but uh, if there's already a value, uh, it should like, just get the value that I already have, and also that I'd never want to have two things doing the same. I only want to have you know, one at most, obviously, doing the, the actual uh, effect. And I also want to give the clients the opportunity to, to expire uh, expire value. Uh, so this is like a basic building block. Uh, you can use it, put it in a map and have an actual cache or you know, have a you know, concurrent stream that expires it every five minutes or you know, it's very sort of very basic fundamental thing. Uh, and bear in mind that you can have different gets be called concurrently and expire can also be called concurrently and there's some waiting to do if you know, I'm doing a get while something else is updating. So it's actually, when you look at it, it's actually not, not that simple, not that simple to do. Uh, but uh, even more importantly, I want to show the methodology rather than the actual solution because what, what often happens is that for simple example, a lock solution actually works well. It's simple enough, it might be simpler, but then it scales horribly with complexity when you have multiple locks and you kind of don't know, don't know what to do. Sort of kind of like uh, side effects, I guess. And so the way I want to do it, uh, I want to, um, encode uh, a state machine. So what was sort of the state space that this thing can be on? Simple siltrate, and it can be in three states. So either is in the value state, it means there is a valid value inside my cached. Or it's in the no value state, so either you know, no one has ever called anything on it, or it has been expired and no one has got anything from it yet. Or um, it's, been, it's in the process of being updated. So there's a, something in flight trying to fetch whatever it is that you need to put there. And whilst you're doing it, someone else wants to get the value. Um, and note how we can introduce sort of compositional waiting. So the only case in which we need to wait is when we are in the updating phase. So what we do, we just put a deferred inside our updating, uh, updating uh, case of the ADT. And now, let's, let's sort of look, uh, it's fairly dense, but I'm going to sort of talk you through it, uh, and we can, uh, we can discuss how it works. So first of all, I'm creating a ref uh, with the ADT that I've designed, and it starts as a no value, and then from that ref, I create a cached, and I just need to implement, uh, implement everything. So the first thing here, I'm going to create this deferred, and this, like, you need to create it in advance because you might want to use it in one of the... Uh, one of the uh, alternatives, one of the cases, so don't look at it for now. Um, and most of the things happen in this modify thing. So again, most of what you need to do happens as this state transition function. So what if you're calling get and you are in the value, value state? Well, that's fairly simple. The state, remember that like modify took, uh, you need to return a, a pair, a tuple. And I don't know, maybe, I don't know if, a lot of people don't know that syntax, except then they write maps with that, but that's just a tuple, like the slim arrow, it's just a, a tuple of two things. Um, so if the state uh, is, in, in, is a, in the value phase, uh, I'm not gonna change it, it's still in the value state, uh, and I'm just gonna return, uh, return the V I have there. Semantics of get, if the thing is already there, I'm just gonna return it. So if the state instead is updating, it means that while I'm calling get, there's something else trying to fetch the, the value for me. And that updating contains a deferred, which means, again, remember, deferred means I want to wait on something to happen. And the thing you're going to wait on is for this value to be ready. So I'm not going to change the state. There's still something in flight. But I'm going to get on that deferred, which is only going to return once the value is there. Uh, and the deferred is actually sort of either trouble of A, so what I showed you with that consumer, because the computation might fail. I want to be able to actually fail the waiters if the, the thing fetching failed. Otherwise, they're going to be stuck forever waiting for something that is never going to get there. And then I guess the most interesting case, what if there's no value and I'm calling get? So if I'm calling get, 
and there's no value, I need to start the update process. So the new state is going to be updating, uh, and I'm going to put the, the, new, the new deferred in there. So I'm introducing a new condition for people to wait on. And then I'm going to fetch, and fetch is going to fetch it, like do the DFA, complete the deferred, and then return the, return the result. And now I'm going to look at it in like a bit more, bit more detail. So what fetch does, it calls FA. FA is the constructor here. Oh, well, it, it was in the previous slide, but basically the thing you're caching on. Uh, I'm going to attempt it because I, wanna, I don't want to show secret and errors. I want to handle them explicitly. And then I'm going to set the state. So if uh, the result was uh, successful, I'm just going to put value in there with a new value. And if the thing was unsuccessful, I'm just going to put no value. So imagine something where like, I, I was in the updating state, I set this, and then the next call comes. If I succeeded, then the next call is going to find itself in the value state, and then it's gonna, just going to get it. And if he failed, the next call is going to be in the no value state. But what about those calls that happened whilst the thing was running, but before it finished? Where they hit the updating state, which I had deferred, so I need to complete the deferred so that I actually unlock also all the, 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 the gets that happened in between when I started updating and when I finished updating. Imagine something is low like a, a network, network call or something. Um, and that's basically it. Uh, and uh, this is actually the hardest part. Uh, and expire is just a very simple, very simple uh, update on the ref where like, well, if I had a value, now I want no value. And if I had no value, there is still no value. Um, and if it's updating, well, this is like you can decide in a few different ways. What I decided here is that if I am expiring something while the new one is being updated, I don't want to, like, whatever. Like, the new one is going to be fine. It's not going to be expired anymore. So I'm not doing, I'm not doing anything. Uh, and same thing here. Like, you could say that uh, if you expire the value, I want to get the new one already. But the semantics I'm going for here is that when you expire, it's expired, and it's only going to get uh, fetched on the next get call. So again, this is because I wanted to do it this way, but you can change the semantics uh, kind of however you want. Okay, so, so that's it um, on the sort of the basic logic. And one thing I like about this is that kind of all of your logic is, is in this transition function, which you can test uh, in a few different ways, including property-based testing or property-based uh, state-based testing where it tries and get all the interleaving and actually make sure that your transition function works the way you want to, as opposed to having to try and get a bunch of different locks in the right sort of configuration and see that things uh, work the way you want. But there is a big catch. And the big catch is interruption. Uh, so interruption just means the ability to sort of stop a running computation. Uh, most typical example is a timeout. Uh, and the problem is that there's like a fundamental trade-off. So on one hand, you want resource safety. So you want to make sure that you always release things once you've done. And to have resource safety, you want zero interruption. You want to just handle the errors and not worry about people just interrupting you. But also, you want deadlock safety. Or just in general, there's a very long thing. I want to time it out, so I want to be able to interrupt it. So you have this like, sort of fundamental trade-off between these two useful things to have safe concurrency. And this is actually fairly hard to get right. We might change a few things in the model to make it easier. Uh, but I want to give you like, some advice on how, to deal, on how to deal with this. So first of all, sort of get familiar with bracket guarantee and uncancelable. and kind of know what each one, each one does. Uh, I'm just going to talk about guarantee, which just means always run something, no matter what happens, even on, in, 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 in the case of interruption. And that's something that's not going to be interruptible itself. Um, try and restore state on interruption. So never leave something in a sort of faulty, faulty state. Uh, and we're going to see the example for that. And then separating state and waiting actually helps. This is actually, I didn't think about interruption when designing this, because we didn't have interruption cuts effect by then. But it's, it turns out it's a big help, because normally you want to only interrupt waiting things, you know, like long running things, like waiting on a network call on a deferred. Uh, but you only want to restore the state. So having them as separate things uh, really, really helps with, with this complex thing. So let's see when can this thing be interrupted and how to kind of deal with it. So the update itself is uh, 
atomic, but then you return an action and then you run the action. So all the actions are potentially interruptible. So this one just returns the value. What happens if we interrupt it? Nah, no big deal. So what about this one? I have something waiting for the cache value and then I decide to time it out. So that one gets interrupted, but what happens to the, the, my cache? Well, nothing happens because uh, I just, uh, there's a, another thing just, you know, updating it. But what if I update, I interrupt the thing that's fetching? Well, now that's a problem because every, everyone else that's waiting on that state uh, is gonna get stuck in this updating state and not do anything. And now we have like sort of infinite waiting or deadlock. And if you look at fetch itself, it can actually be interrupted in a lot of places. It can be interrupted uh, after you fetch the thing, but before you can update the state, or after you update the state, but before you completed it, or after you completed it, but before you returned. So trying to figure out when something is interrupted uh, is not, not going to work. What you want to do instead uh, is try and think about how to fix uh, the state, how to restore it on interruption. So the way you do it, uh, and again, it looks a bit hairy because I aligned in one slide, but you can sort of split it up. Uh, after this, I'm going to call a guarantee case, which means do this in every case, and you can split on, on whether it was completed, uh, failed, or, or canceled. So if it was completed or, or failed, whatever, I don't do anything because it's already handled here. But was it, what if it was canceled? Um, then I need to do a, another modify. Uh, and look at how the state was. If the state is in a value, it means that the thing was interrupted after it set things uh, correctly, so I don't need to change the state. But I do want to complete anything that was kind of stuck waiting on that, because imagine it was, it was uh, interrupted here. The value is correct, but I didn't get around to do complete. And now there are things waiting, waiting for me. And so I want to call complete on this. But what if actually it got interrupted here. So it did complete. Then I want to attempt that because I, I cannot complete things, complete things twice. Uh, and, uh, and similar in this case, if it got stuck uh, either because there was, you know, it managed to, uh, it failed and then there was no value, that's fine. Or even before it set this. Then I want to set it to no value. So the next call is not going to get stuck on updating. It actually is going to try again because there's no value there. And, and do a similar thing, so complete anything that got, uh, sort of got stuck waiting in between, in between these two. So as you can see, this gets sort of fairly complex, um, and it's something we want to sort of uh, improve, but the basic strategy is still sort of valid, because you can still model things as state machine and sort of vet each transition uh, carefully, instead of having to um, sort of think about several locks and how the state of each, of each lock uh, works. Uh, and that's it. So you have Refn deferred, uh, your basic building blocks for composable concurrency. Uh, yeah, I'm not on Twitter, but just come and talk to me in person on reach out on, on Gitter. Thank you. Thank you, Fabio. Any questions? We have time for like two questions. Uh, thank you for that. It's very interesting. Uh, so the the last slide you showed uh, with recovery from interruption uh, seems very very hairy. I'm curious if if you can uh, very hard to reason about. Do you can you elaborate a bit on what you're thinking to to uh, simplify that, or is it possible yeah. that the primitives are so too first of all a meta thought. I was unsure whether to include it or not because just in terms of giving a talk, it's best not to include it to not scare people away. But then there needs to be a place where someone that wants to learn how to do it. You know, I need to have an example, so I decided to go with it. <laughs> I think, so first of all, it just use higher level constructs. So a lot of the things we do in FS2 deal with this for you. Uh, and it's kind of inherent uh, about stream being more powerful uh, than IO, that is able to, to, to build things more safely. Um, the other thing we might just wanna, you know, when you, when you decide to implement interruption, you can be, you can have different levels of granularity. So first we were just interrupting on async boundaries. And then we decided to interrupt on every flat map. We might want to go back. I don't know, to be honest. We're still, we're still discussing what's the best way. Because as I said, it's kind of a fundamental trade-off between maximum resource safety and maximum deadlock safety. So getting a model that ensures both while still being simple uh, is a current sort of research problem for us. 
And I don't think it's never, I don't think it's ever been done sort of properly in any other ecosystem either. So ASCII has got very similar, very similar issues and very similar solutions uh, to this. Um, but yeah, and also the thing is like most code does not need to worry about this. This is like now we're dealing with the primitive that actually needs to deal with the, with the corner case. So yeah, I guess um, it is hairy, uh, but if you use FS2 uh, and you know sort of follow this approach, you can like I feel there's a systematic way out of it, as opposed to being hard and you need to just think hard uh, to solve it. So so yeah, but yeah, it's a good question. We don't know yet. Uh, we need to figure it out. Anybody has a very quick question? If not, we're going to enter into a break yep. and come back around 4.20. Thank you.